Hey guys, this is Mr. Breen, and in this video I'm going to talk about what functions financial intermediaries serve. Why do we need them at all? After all, it seems like they're kind of a middleman. Um, so what kind of purpose could they possibly serve? Why do we allow them to have some of the interest that we would expect um, when we invest? So what are our financial intermediaries? Again, they're the institutions that take money from savers, or we might also call them depositors. They take that money, so here they are here, intermediaries, intermediaries. They take money from savers, and they funnel it to borrowers. And the borrowers pay that money back plus interest, some rate of return, and the savers get it back with some rate of return. But what are some examples? Well, we have banks, pension funds, life insurance companies, our financial intermediaries, and mutual funds. Remember, banks take depositors cash and they lend it out to various kinds of people. People who want homes, people who want cars, people who want to start a business or, or expand a business. Pension funds, they take your money from uh, from paychecks and they invested in different stocks and bonds and try to earn a return for the pensioners and they pay it out to you when you retire and life insurance companies they are very similar you pay them your premium and they invest that money um, and then they they pay that out in insurance policies and they take some as profit and then mutual funds um, so they take uh, they take people's money usually this is for retirement and they invest it in stocks um, and they pay you a certain return back so the first kind of service that we're going to talk about financial intermediaries performing is um, information, um, getting information. So it's not that they have any access to some kind of special information that we couldn't have if we were just lending directly to borrowers, but think about it this way. If a business needs to borrow from 100 or 500 different people um, in order to expand, or if you, in order to go to college, needed to borrow from 100 or 500 different people, um, then you would have each one of those 100 to 500 different people would have to investigate how creditworthy you were or how creditworthy that business owner was. Instead, if just one organization, like a bank, uh, can perform that research, then the costs of that information go way down. They can tell us who's a credit risk. And again, we could figure this out information out on our own, but it's much better to have one bank do it than four or 500 individuals and they can, in, you know, they can inspect your business plan. So if you're a businessman and you want to get a loan from a bank, you're going to need to present your business plan so they can analyze whether that's a good idea or not. Intermediaries also provide investors with liquidity. So if you were going to just lend to your Uncle Bob for whatever business he wants to start up, you wouldn't see that money again until whatever the, whenever the term of the loan ended. So if you lent it to him for five years, you wouldn't have your money for five years. You would have an IOU for five years. If instead you put your money in the bank or in a mutual fund or in something like that, you could get the money out sooner. And the way this works is, you know, how come banks can do this? They have lots of different depositors putting their deposits into things like checking accounts, which we call demand deposits because you could get that money out at any time. And uh, they lend it out to people who want to borrow for the long term. And they don't lend all of it out. They keep some on hand just to make sure that people who do want their money back can get it. And they know that not everyone's going to want it back on every day. So they can offer some liquidity to, uh, to lenders that wouldn't otherwise be possible without financial intermediaries. Finally, financial intermediaries can substantially reduce the risk of lending, not just because um, it costs less for them to gather information than it costs us, but also because they help us diversify our portfolios. Hopefully you remember that a portfolio is just a collection of investments that you own, and diversification means that you're putting your investments in lots of different things, so that if any individual thing fails, your whole, whole portfolio doesn't crash. One of the major lessons you should learn from economics is not to put all your eggs in one basket. That's what this is all about. If you have only $100 to save or 1000 or 10000 you might lend it all to one person or all to a few different people because it's not that much money. And if those people go bankrupt, if those people can't pay back their loans, if they default, then you're kind of sunk. But if you put your money in the bank and lots of other people put their money in the bank, 
and the bank lends out that money to hundreds and thousands of different people, then if one of those hundreds or thousands of people goes uh, bankrupt or defaults on a loan, it's not going to hurt any of those individual depositors all that much. It's just the same with a mutual fund or a life insurance company or a pension fund. They're investing in stocks primarily and also some bonds. And if any one of those stocks crashes, well, they've invested in lots of different company stocks. So one company crashing isn't going to seriously damage the returns of the entire portfolio of the mutual fund and therefore won't seriously harm any of the people who put their money in the mutual fund.